Hi everybody, today we're going to talk about your second set of beef breeds. So these will be number 11 through 20 in your breed ID notebook. Um, you want to have that out so that you can record any important information. Remember with these, unless I say otherwise, you want to assume they are the Bose Taurus species of cattle, um, but there can be some Bose Indicus mixed in with these as well. So our first breed for this week is the Hereford. And Herefords are really easy to recognize because they have red bodies with a white face, white on their dewlap and their underline, a white switch, which is this part at the end of their tail, and a lot of times their legs are also white below the hocks in the back and below the knees in the front. Herefords are the most popular U.S. beef breed, so even more so than Angus, Part of that is that they are very heavy boned and early maturing. So the heavy bone allows them to support a lot of muscle mass. Um, early maturing means you're gonna be able to get them to the finishing process faster. Um, they do come in both polled and horned varieties. Remember that polled means they're born without horns. Um, when they do have horns, they tend to curl around towards the front of their face. Um, they are known for having a good thickness of their body pretty good feed efficiency, so you get a high yield of muscle for the amount of feed that you have to provide. And they're tolerant of cold climates because of their thick coats, which makes them a good option to raise in much of the country. Next is our Highland cows, and these guys are just the cutest in my opinion. Um, they're bred in the Scottish Highlands, and if you know anything about that area of the world, there's extremely harsh, cold, conditions there, lots of snow. So these guys have long shaggy fur and that helps them survive the extreme cold. That's naturally in that area. They're also known for being very docile. In fact, it was so cold um, that these cows were traditionally brought into people's houses in the winter so that they would stay warm. So they had to be very friendly um, and they were bred for those traits. They're also known for being exceptional mothers. They're very good at raising calves. But one of the downsides of this breed is they are slow to mature. So it's gonna take longer to get to that market weight. However, there's a payoff because they have some of the most tender and flavorful beef once they do finally reach that maturity. So these would be chosen for colder parts of the country. A lot of times people like to keep these cows as pets as well. And there's even miniature varieties that are now being bred. Breed number 13 is the Limousine. And this is a French breed that comes in a golden wheat to a rusty red color. And one of the ways you can tell them apart from say a red Angus is they tend to have a lighter muzzle. They have light areas around their eyes and a lighter underline. And that comes from more of a pinkish skin than those red Angus would have. They tend to be very heavily muscled with very long bodies compared to other beef cattle. And they are known for their cutability. And cutability is the number of cuts that you can get from the carcass. So if you compare this to another beef animal, you may be able to get more steaks out of their loin area, for instance. Um, so that high cutability makes them very popular. Number 14 is the Maine Anjou, another French breed. These were originally bred as work animals, so bred for more of those draft purposes. They are a composite breed and they are three quarters shorthorn and one quarter mansell. And they come in multiple colors, but it's usually either this cherry red and white or black and white. Um, but these white markings are fairly standard. They will differ a little bit from cow to cow, but you tend to have definitely some white on the underline and legs and usually a little bit of white on the back as well. These are known for being excellent beef producers. They're also known for their cutability and their high carcass quality. Our next breed, number 15, is the Murray Gray. And this is one that you won't see a lot in the US. It's still pretty rare here. However, it's very popular in Australia um, because it really suits the climate there. And I have also included them here because it is a very unique color with this gray. Um, so this is a composite breed as well, and it is bred from Angus and Shorthorns. 
um, and it comes in these various shades of brownish gray. It's medium in size and it's always pulled, never horned, and they're known for being exceptionally easy to care for while producing very well marbled meat with very little extra muscular fat. So they will have some of that marbling on the inside of the meat, but there won't be a large fat cap around the pieces, which is preferred by a lot of consumers. Breed number 16 is the Red Pole. This is an endangered breed, but I've chosen to include it because it is one of the more important endangered breeds that we should probably be trying to preserve. It is all solid red, even the udder. So that's one way that you can tell this part from Red Angus is it's much more solidly pigmented. And that pigment in their skin and in their fur actually helps them avoid sunburn. It's a dual purpose breed. It's known for being equally good at producing beef and producing milk. And it's especially great if the milk is used for cheese. Um, one of the biggest things that red poles are great for is during breeding, if you crossbreed them, they do introduce a lot of hybrid vigor into other breeds because it is a genetic subset that really isn't around as much anymore since they're endangered. They have a much longer lifetime than other breeds, so they can still be bred at up to 15 years old. And one of the interesting things about their milk is that people who are allergic to milk normally can sometimes drink milk from a red pole because it has a smaller flat fat globule in the milk um, that doesn't always cause the allergic reactions. Even though the red pole is not as popular anymore, this was a really important breed in early American history since it allowed people who brought this breed over to have both a source of meat and of dairy. And then the next cow that we're going to look at, the shorthorn, is another dual purpose animal. So this is bred both for meat and for dairy, um, and some people will use it for both, some will just focus on one or the other. Shorthorns come in either all red, all white, or roan varieties, and roan occurs when both genes are actually expressed at the same time in different parts of the coat. So you get this modeling kind of effect because there are red hairs and there are white hairs in the same area. Um, and shorthorns were one of the first breeds to be brought to the U.S. back in the 1700s. They were the first established U.S. breed herd book. So a herd book keeps track of all the genetics of that particular breed, and it has all of the pedigrees and things like that in it. It's this shorthorn breed is now part of the bloodline of over 30 other breeds. So it's really important for forming those composite breeds as well. And it's known as just a very well-rounded cow. It produces good beef, but it also produces great milk. Um, so it's kind of the perfect all over. You can raise it anywhere. Um, and that's why they've become so popular. So after Angus and Hereford, Shorthorn would probably be your next most popular in the U.S. In Europe, the most popular is the Simmental. And this is a Swiss breed that dates back to the Middle Ages. You can see it's a little bit larger than most breeds on average um, and has really heavily muscling. Um, it comes in multiple colors, so that makes them a little bit hard to identify um, because they do come in all black and then they look very similar to Angus, but not quite as square at that point. Um, they also come in red um, and other colors as well, but the black and red are most common. When they do come in this red color, they often will have white patches on their face, their underline, and their legs. However, unlike the Hereford, they have a thinner coat, which allows you to tell them apart. Simmentals are known for their excellent conformation. They have nice, steady um, angles to their body, and it allows them to hold up a lot of weight. And they're very thickly muscled, but they don't have a lot of excess fat. It's more intramuscular. Number 19 is the Texas Longhorn. These guys are really easy to identify because of their longhorns that go straight out to either side. They're descendants of the Spanish Andalusian cattle that Columbus brought over to the Americas. Then some of those cattle escaped and they were living kind of or in the areas around the colonies and people started re-domesticating them um, and farming them. 
They adapted very well to the harsh climate of the Southwest that they were first introduced to, hence Texas. Um, and because of that, this breed is really resistant to disease and parasites, and it can survive really hot temperatures. So they're very, very hardy. They come in multiple colors, including lots of different variations of roan. Um, and so pretty much every color under the sun, you can find a Texas Longhorn that's that color. Their horns do curve upwards a little bit as they go out, and they can spread to at least four feet and anywhere from six to eight feet in length. So they're really quite long. Um, they're very slow to mature, but they're very fertile. They're very hardy. They can live on sparse rangeland where you couldn't really keep any other cattle. They will survive there. And of course, they are the mascot of Texas A&M, very fittingly. Our last breed for this week is one that is known for the quality of its meat above all else. So this is Wagyu, and Wagyu cattle are Japanese bred, and they are the ones that produce that super high quality Kobe beef. So if you've heard of Kobe beef, it's usually very, very expensive on menus. Um, it will go for up to 10 times the price of a normal burger, a normal steak. Um, and it is because they have so much intramuscular fat and so much marbling in there that it's very, very tender and very, very rich. This is considered the highest quality meat in the world. It can only be called Kobe beef if it's raised in Japan. However, we do have American Wagyu, where it's the same breed, they're just raised in America. These cows are often really pampered. They get massages, they get fed things like beer, and that's all supposed to make their beef taste exceptionally better. They are almost always black, but they can be red, and they have these short, stubby little horns that come straight out from their head. So if you compare the meat of a Wagyu cow to a typical Angus cow, which already is a much higher quality beef than a lot of breeds, um, you'll see that you have much more marbling inside the meat of the Wagyu. Um, some people think this is a more attractive color because it's a little bit lighter and not as deep red as the Angus, and that is because it's fattier in nature. So those are the characteristics that they've been specifically bred for. Um, and that wraps up your breeds for this week. Thanks so much, and just make sure you have your breed ID notebook up to date and you're studying what they look like so that you can recognize them on your quiz.